I'm going to speak in English to um, make it easier for everybody. Um, I want to start by thanking um, Professor Kururo for inviting me here and for all the people involved in this institution for making this conference possible. Um, I've never written about um, food and eating before in a direct way. When I first spoke about some aesthetics in 1998 when I conceived the project, at, after my first lecture there was a lot of excitement and interest and it all focused on two subjects, sex and food. Um, people just assumed that in talking about the pleasures and beauties of the body, it would have to be about sex or food. Those are the common pleasures. And I realized that in order for some aesthetics to gain a foothold in the university and in serious academic research, I should stay away from those topics, at least in the beginning. And so I did, and some aesthetics has thrived, and um, I first decided I would talk about the aesthetics of lovemaking. And now I'm finally, you know, coming to food. Uh, I have to say there's been a lot of difficulty in these terms to these more basic and common uh, aesthetic pleasures. Not only old philosophical prejudices, but um, even family difficulties. I know when I was doing my research in the aesthetics of erotics, uh, my wife had very serious issues with that. And um, the complications of my research have led to severe marital difficulties. And um, I have to say that um, I had to deal with parental disapproval. My dad said, why are you degrading philosophy by going to Italy to talk to pasta, talk about pasta? And um, my answer to him was simply that um, without food, there is no life, and without life, there is no philosophy. It's very simple argumentation. And so, um, despite those um, family difficulties, which are based on very deep cultural prejudices, I'm happy to be here today and talk about um, some aesthetics in the art of eating. This will be a presentation without a PowerPoint. I have some slides in the workshop. Um, it's a dry talk, uh, analytic in nature. The last part, if you'll have the patience, has some narrative in it about my experience of the aesthetics of eating in Japan, where I lived for a certain time. But I, I will read it slowly and um, thank the translator in advance for um, working with a provisional text. The 17th century French aphorist, uh, La Rochefoucauld, who sometimes traded his witty maxims for tasty dishes and recipes, famously remarked, manger est un besoin, savoir manger est un art. Eating is a need, but knowing how to eat is an art. Today we find many texts that speak of the art of eating, sometimes with impressive erudition and brilliance, but they do so without adequately clarifying the exact referent of that term, the art of eating, which is actually ambiguous. Very often the art of eating serves as a general term to cover the entire field of gastronomy. But my aim in this paper is to introduce more precision in gastronomical theory by focusing on the art of eating in a more restricted sense and by distinguishing that sense from other meanings of the term. For economy of exposition, I will use the term eating in the broad sense that includes drinking, and I will likewise use food to include drink. It is noteworthy, however, that in China, perhaps the oldest and historically richest of food cultures, already in ancient times, the Chinese had a term that combined food and drink. It was called yin shu. In considering the aesthetics of gastronomy, one can focus on at least three distinct, though closely related and sometimes overlapping elements. First would be the diverse and often complex processes, methods, aims, criteria, and experiences in preparing food. 
This can include also the preparations for the presentation of food with their accessory implements, such as crockery and cutlery on the table. We could call this dimension the art of cuisine and divide it into food preparation and presentation. Second, aesthetic study and discussion can focus on the food and drink objects themselves in terms of their properties relevant for aesthetic experience and judgment. These properties include not only the formal and sensory qualities that these edible objects present to taste, smell, and other senses. They also include the larger symbolic and social meanings of various foods, which can, of course, involve meanings related to culture and even to nutritional properties. We could call this dimension of gastronomy the art of food appreciation and criticism. Apart from cookbooks, most food writing seems to be of this genre. Many people enjoy reading food writing and looking at food images in magazines or on the screen without actually eating the food or drink present, and certainly without preparing. There is, however, a third dimension of gastronomy which concerns the various processes and considerations involved in actually ingesting food and drink into one's body. This concerns this concern with how we eat and drink, in terms of our modes and manners of ingestion, can be construed as the art of eating in its narrower, stricter, or more precise sense. And my paper is focused on this stricter sense, whose meaning I would not extend to include digestion, which is standardly defined as a mechanical, chemical process, whereas art, especially in the aesthetic sense, implies intelligent choice, judgment, or reflection. So the art of eating in the strong sense as I define it here is still broad enough to provide a rich field for gastronomical research, and it certainly impacts the other two areas of gastronomy, just as it influences also digestion. I focus on this dimension of eating because it needs more attention in order to bring its study up to the level of research of the two other dimensions of gastronomical aesthetics, food preparation and food appreciation. Though gastronomy's most astute writers have sometimes touched on this third dimension, they have neglected some of its essential aspects, whose importance I aim to highlight in my lecture. So the first part, the nature and value of the art of eating. We should first distinguish the art of eating from the mere act of eating. Eating can be merely an instinct-driven, habitual behavior of ingesting food in an entirely thoughtless, automatic, and crudely insensitive way. The most basic behavior of ingesting edibles for pleasurable nutrition when stimulated by hunger and thirst is shared by other animals, though the human form of eating differs in being profoundly shaped by culture. Such shaping involves far more than our human use of cooking, which anyway refers to the preparation and presentation of food, rather than its ingestion. Human culture, through its use of language, enables us to name or identify what we eat, and thus better select, communicate, acquire, and critically evaluate our food choices, and thus organize our ingestion of them in an orderly form or sequence that adds meaning to the act of eating. The very notion of linguistically defined meals, such as breakfast, lunch, and dinner, rather than haphazard foraging and feeding, reflects this cultural imprint on the way we eat. So do the linguistically defined notions of sequenced courses, such as appetizer, entree, dessert, or the distinction of main dish and sides that organize our eating experience. Animals clearly lack such order, structure, and meaning in their food consumption, which is why some theorists prefer to say that animals simply feed rather than eat. History has long recognized that one difference marking the transition from animal or savage status to human culture is knowing how to eat. And we can see this even in the ancient epic of Gilgamesh. When the shrewd founder of modern gastronomy, Briya Savarin, proclaims, animals feed, men eat, 
and smart men know how to eat, he implies a further distinction. The acquisition of basic human eating practices through acculturation and muscle memory is contrasted to a much deeper level of eating, know-how, that requires intelligence, refined sensibility, and focused reflection on the qualities and effects of one's eating options, preferences, and habits. Gastronomes, of course, belong to this higher class of eaters who have an articulate, reflective knowledge with respect to eating. But I would propose a further distinction between those gastronomes who simply know how to select and enjoy good food and those who also know how to eat aesthetically namely those whose knowledge of food and sensitive tasting is translated into an art of eating focused on the aesthetic elements and qualities of the experience of ingesting food. Those aesthetic features go beyond the realm of gustatory taste and even, I will argue, beyond the five familiar senses. One could distinguish this fine art of eating as the art of dining. How should we classify this art? First, it is essentially a temporal art. Time and timing are crucial in many ways to its artistic success and aesthetic pleasures. One enjoys it in terms of temporal sequencing, not merely one course leading to another, but one mouthful leading to the next or more precisely, one mouthful leading to a, to a complex sequencing of smelling, biting, tasting, chewing, swallowing, and breathing. Each of these activities involves its own complex sensory motor sequences and yet must be finely coordinated with the other activities to achieve a pleasing, harmonizing rhythm to the performative process of eating. Moreover, on a larger temporal scale, the different mouthfuls and phases of ingestion should be arranged in an aesthetically satisfying narrative structure of beginning, middle, and end. Time is thus essential. Good eating, perhaps even more than good cooking, really requires taking one's time. Any movement for slow food must equally insist on slowing down the act of eating so as to realize and savor the full potential of the art of dining's range of pleasures. Ria Savarin repeatedly insists on the importance of time, chastising his best friend for the habitual vice of eating too fast, and listing time as one of the four conditions necessary and sufficient for fully enjoying our meals. Like the paradigm temporal arts of music and dance, eating is a performing art whose aesthetic enjoyment is in the performative process of eating. Some thinkers might challenge this view, arguing that one's satisfaction in the art of eating is not really in the eating, but in the objects eaten. That the relevant aesthetic object in the art of eating, therefore, is simply the food and not the act of eating. This implicit assumption lies beyond gastronomy's concentration on the food object and the best ways to prepare and present it. I appreciate food's crucial contribution to the art of eating, but I would nonetheless argue that the art of eating goes well beyond the aesthetic qualities of the objects eaten. There are aesthetic features and qualities pertaining to the activities of the eating process itself if that process is done with artful attention and care. An analogy from other arts might make this point clearer. There is clearly a temporal and performing art which standardly relies on another art, theater. Theater is a temporal and performing art that relies on literature, a dramatic script as its object. But theatrical art goes well beyond the aesthetic and artistic features of the script as literature. Its distinctive artistry and aesthetic experience lies in what the embodied dramatic performance does with the literary script, how it actualizes and enriches its aesthetic qualities, artistic meanings, and theatrical potential. 
Good theatrical art not only deepens the artistic value already in the script, but contributes its own theatrical values. In the same way, eating as a fine art not only deepens the aesthetic pleasures to be found in the food we eat, it also contributes aesthetic pleasures that go beyond the tastes, smells, and visual forms of our food objects. These further pleasures concern somatic-based movements and perceptions involved in the activities of eating and the manner in which we perform them. We can take pleasure in the way we chew, the way we sip or slurp or swallow. We can enjoy the arc of movement that brings the fork to our lips, the warmth and weight of a bowl of coffee in our hands, and so forth. Before I go further into the different aspects of our ways of eating and their aesthetic potential, I should underline the multiple importance of eating as a performative art. Part of this importance derives from the performative character of this art. Its artistic elements and stylizing qualities are so closely attached to the person who performs this art that their aesthetic effects remain with that person and reshape her aesthetically. In this way, one could argue that the art of eating is superior to that of cooking, because in cooking, the valued end is an external object, the dish of food, rather than something intrinsic to the creating artist and affecting him. A cook is not affected by the bad food he makes unless he eats it. With the art of eating, the valued end is the enjoyment of eating itself, which is inseparable from the act of eating, and directly affects the eater. As the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In other words, outside the pudding. But in the art of eating, the proof is in the eating itself. Eating's pleasure is in the act of eating. Now, eating is a daily activity, typically performed at least three times a day. It is a necessary activity without which we could not live. It's a universal activity since everyone must eat and everyone has not only a natural need, but a natural ability to eat. And for such reasons, eating is an extremely important activity, one worth cultivating as an art for improved practice. As bad eating habits can be damaging and deadly, so the benefits of improving the ways we eat are multiple. First and most obviously, perfecting our eating practices increase our pleasure. This is because, more generally, heightened attention to our pleasures heightens our enjoyment of them, not only by intensifying their perception, but also by adding to them the pleasures of reflection. Eating pleasures can be sharpened through practice because we eat so often, and we eat as long as we live. Eating is an art we can continue to practice, enjoy, and perfect long into old age even when we have long lost our capacity for arts and sports that we enjoyed earlier in life. Although we must, of course, adjust our diet as we age. The art of eating involves reflection on our style of eating, not only with respect to what foods we eat, but also our ways of eating, including how much, how fast, our sequencing of meals and mouthfuls, the ways and rhythms of chewing and swallowing. Besides augmenting our pleasures, better eating leads to better health. By improving our choices in what we eat, we provide the body with the right balance of nutrients while avoiding foods that disturb our digestion, drain our energy, or otherwise impair our proper functioning of body and mind. It prevents obesity, and it goes beyond mere health to enhance one's somatic appearance. This is not merely with respect to one's figure. Smart eating can promote the glow of smooth skin, the textured luster of hair, and the radiance of healthy energy. Nor is its impact on appearance merely visual, since what or how we eat can strongly affect the odors and even the sounds our bodies, eat, our bodies make. Think of onions, garlic, or beans. If we recognize that to some extent, as Feuerbach, remarked, we are what we eat, then a reflective art of eating serves to advance the philosophical aim of self-knowledge by making us more aware of our eating habits and how they affect both us and those others who share our meals with us. 
For the gastronomical art of eating, such self-knowledge is more than an end in itself. It serves a practical, meliorist means toward the aims of self-perfection through improved self-regulation and artful shaping or aesthetic discipline. Knowing how we eat is a step to learning how to eat better, with greater awareness, enjoyment, grace, and understanding. And such achievements can give us not only aesthetic pleasures, but also the ethical satisfactions of self-mastery and self-cultivation. As a daily habit governed by desire and ultimately grounded in our strongest instincts of survival, eating provides an excellent medium for shaping the self and its powers of choice, introspection, taste, discrimination, order, and discipline, and willpower. Its value for self-knowledge and self-care should not obscure the social benefits of an art of eating. Human eating is intrinsically a social practice, even when one dies alone. But most of our eating, and surely the most important eating, is done in the company of others, where artful eating not only adds pleasure to one's own dining, but improves the enjoyment of one's dining companions to create distinctively social and communicative aesthetic pleasures of sharing an informed and reflective appreciation of the dining experience, an experience that goes beyond the taste of food. Many gastronomical theorists therefore emphasize the social pleasures of eating, insisting on proper company as one of the necessary conditions for the best delights of gastronomy. What they, emphasize is, what they emphasize are the pleasures of conversation from good company. I, however, would also insist on the non-discursive visual pleasures of seeing their companions eat with both gusto but also refinement through intelligent and graceful movement in handling the food they share together, whether in ingesting it themselves or passing, placing, or pouring it for others. And I would further insist on the diner's own proprioceptive pleasures of participating in such coordinated movement through their dining actions. Such artful reflective dining, through such artful reflective dining, a meal becomes an artwork of improvised group choreography whose silent yet communicative harmonies not only serve as a means for efficiently coordinating food ingestion, but can provide powerful pleasures in their own right. At the end of my paper, I'll give an example of such diet. But first, I'd like to articulate some uh, of the dimensions of this artful eating. Perfecting sensory perception through heightened sensory discrimination and transmodal sensory appreciation is perhaps the most distinctive way that the art of eating contributes to some aesthetic self-cultivation. Gastronomical theorists have frequently highlighted eating as a multi-sensory experience that provides the skilled gastronomer an object to be appreciatively savored both as a source of pleasure and as a place for perfecting her senses by honing her perceptual discrimination and acuity. Ria Sagaran repeatedly insists on the essential perfectibility of the human senses while advocating the role of sensory transmodality in perfecting sensory perception. Different senses combine and integrate to aid each other. And with taste, the example is smell. Taste is very highly um, reliant on smell. Despite the fact that gastronomers recognize multisensory enjoyment, even the best of them fail to realize the full range of, guess, of sensory pleasures and their transmodality. They speak of the tongue, the nose, and the palate, along with the eye and the ear. But what they forget are usually dimensions of touch, whose role in eating pleasure surely transcend the tongue and palate to include the lips and teeth. We appreciate on our lips the warmth of a hot coffee or the cool wetness of a beer, just as we appreciate the firm crunchiness of an apple. The tactile pleasures of eating are not confined to the mouth. 
The same heat of the coffee is often enjoyed in the hands that are warmed by the cup. Apart from the warmth or coolness, we also enjoy tactily the weight and shapes of the eating implements that we use. Moreover, with finger food, even our hands can enjoy tactily what we eat. For example, the textured feel of a waffle cone, the warm, brainy feel of a toasted sesame bagel. Before the use of knives and forks became common, the tactile experience of eating was probably more prominent in the diner's consciousness. But even if not explicitly noticed, it surely forms an element of that experience, and greater to intent attention to it will increase our enjoyment of it. Now there's a sensory dimension that's so far been neglected by all the gastronomical theorists that I've read. And that's the sensory dimension of proprioception and kinesthesia. Even the great Brias Savarin ignored it, perhaps because it's not one, one of Aristotle's five senses. But I would insist on its value in the art of eating. And I can give you an example. Consider the Japanese eating of soba or udon. There is a distinctive proprioceptive experience of strongly sucking the long noodles into the mouth. An experience that anyone will notice once it is pointed out. And it's a feeling that's distinctly pleasurable. There's an enjoyable feeling of micromuscular power and focused energy through the vigorous suction movement, a pleasure that cannot be reduced to its symbolic association with our initial infant-sucking bliss, nor to the sometimes amusing sound that noodle-sucking makes. Chewing can also provide proprioceptive enjoyment. If one attends to its movements and shapes them harmoniously or rhythmically, perhaps even in synchrony with one's eating partner's chewing. Tongue movements and swallowing motions often further kinesthetic enjoyment the familiar pleasures of gulping down drinks with long swallows, known in English by the term chuckle, is largely a proprioceptive affair, since the liquid is swallowed too quickly for properly savoring the taste. But the pleasure of eating's movements is not confined to the mouth. We can enjoy the grip of our hand on a wine glass, the kinesthetic smoothness of our hand and arm movements when we skillfully, gracefully use our eating instruments. Proprioception includes not only feelings of muscle tension and movement, but also feelings of inner body temperature. If we are attentive, we can sometimes feel a pleasant sensation of inner warmth in eating, as distinguished from the external warmth of the food that we feel through our sense of touch. I'm not going to insist on these for the sake of time. I'm going to move to the next part of my paper and talk a bit, very briefly, about what needs to be still done in the theory of the art of eating in this narrow sense. And that would be an analysis of the different elements or dimensions of this art of eating. There won't be time for me to give a full analysis, but I'll start with a minimal classification of basic categories, along with some comments about one of the categories. So a minimal classification of the elements or categories in this art of eating would be posture, external movements, bringing food to your mouth, internal movements, chewing, swallowing, etc., and perceptions which can be classified both in terms of the different spaces in which the perception is directed, inner and outer, and in terms of the different dimensions of quality that the perception perceives. For instance, the different sensory modalities, but also modalities of rhythm, harmony, tension, and energy. But I'm just going to focus here on the complexities of posture. Today, it seems obvious that artful dining demands a seated posture, but historically, this was not always so. In ancient Greek and Roman cultures, and apparently still earlier in the Middle East, festive eating was done in a reclined position on couches. 
The reason may be largely symbolic. Reclining symbolizes leisure, ease, and comfort, which highlight the pleasurable dimension of eating by marking it off from the context of labor, which usually precludes lying down on the job, and even from the hurried or narrowly functioned styles of eating that labor demands. In Greek and Roman, its Greek and Roman origins were religious. But the question would be, and it's something to analyze, in terms of anatomy, it's not the most comfortable way to eat the way the Romans did, lying on your side with all your weight leaning on your left elbow. Uh, it's not very comfortable for balance. It's not the best way to get food in your mouth. But um, even though today there's probably universal agreement that it's best to eat in the sitting position, and this may be not the product of our rationalizing the art of eating, but again, the product of religion. Christianity's belief that the Roman way of eating on the side, lying down, encouraged immoral and uh, sacrilegious um, sensuality and the sin of sloth or laziness since you're lying down. So the reasons that we began eating upright are probably religious and not hedonistic or anatomical. But even if we agree today that it's best to eat for pleasure by sitting rather than lying, the question is still, what kind of posture? How far from the table should you be? On what part of the seat should you sit? Where should your feet be positioned in respect to your shoulders? So there are a lot of questions and details here, and I can't go into it. What I'm going to do to conclude my paper in the next few minutes is give you a narrative about my experience of the art of eating as an art from my personal life in Japan um, when I studied with a Zen master um, near Hiroshima, where I was a visiting professor for and I allow myself to do this narrative partly because this is a common device in food writing. There is always a story. So my story concerns the art of eating practiced at a Zen dojo near Hiroshima where I did my training with a Zen master Orochi during a year's research appointment where they invited me because of my work in Soma Studies. And my story exemplifies how Zen mindfulness can transform everyday practices into beautiful performative parts of living through awakened attentiveness of mindful performance. On the one hand, our meals were paradigms of ordinary simplicity. We sat on the floor in the kitchen around the humble low wooden table with no one formally serving us. The food was plain and unimaginable though of passable taste, and it was presented in the most simple and unadorned way. The crockery and cutlery were equally humble, the kind that one could find in a Japanese dollar store, and they were old with use and sometimes even slightly chipped or damaged. But in contrast to this bare ordinariness of stage and props, the actual action of the meal was extraordinary in performative grace and thoughtful elegance, as each movement was meant to be executed and experienced as the focus of careful, mindful, loving attention. Rather than simply being necessary breaks for physical nourishment and relief from the trainee's essential activity of meditation, the meals at the Zen Dojo were in fact an extension of our training in awakened awareness but by other means than sitting meditation, and in other venues than the meditation hall or zendo. Meals were a place where we could demonstrate awakened mindfulness in active everyday movement rather than in mere meditative sitting. And we would do so in a challenging context where our appetites and unconscious habits were fully aroused by the food and thus especially potent for distracting our focused attention to the present moment of our performed movements and experience, which was also a collaborative experience of eating with others. As we ate, the master's penetrating and authoritative gaze would gauge our progress in mindful awareness 
from the quality of our eating style, from the grace of our movements, the way we handled our bowls and chopsticks, how we chewed and swallowed our food, how we passed food to our eating companions, whether we noticed when they were interested in receiving a dish that was in our reach. Knowing this Zen master was judging our mindfulness in eating, we trainees would also critically examine each other's dining performance while seeking to maximize the mindful grace of our own eating style. The result was that everyday ordinary meals became an extraordinary experience of mindful coordinated action. A sophisticated, elegant choreography of dining movement pursued with heightened attentiveness to graceful movement and careful respect for one's comrades and one's food, as well as for oneself and one's teacher, the Roshi or Master. Now for me, meals posed a special challenge. This was not because of the dojo's rustic Japanese cuisine that was very different from that typical Japanese restaurant thing and had its funky features. I was accustomed to such food, having married into a Japanese family that cherished all varieties of traditional Japanese cooking. Had I not been able to enjoy the dojo's food, I could have never survived there, since one was obliged to eat all that one was served. One trainee who did not finish his raw squid at dinner found the remains of that squid on his plate the next day at breakfast. My special dining challenge, however, was to eat with graceful, mindful elegance, since I knew that my habitual manners of eating were rather careless, casual, and often sloppy. I also knew that the Master Oroshi would be paying close attention to my eating style, since at our very first meal together, he shocked me by his brutally frank critique of me. You're technically quite skillful at using chopsticks, he noted, perhaps because your wife is Japanese. But for a professor of aesthetics, he continued, you eat in a most ugly manner. And I felt my breath stop and my face flush red. I did not know what to say, but fortunately, Roshi continued by explaining that my technical competence in using chopsticks was ruined by the sloppily thoughtless manner in which I picked them up and put them down, but also by the graceless way I handled my rice bowl and teacup. The inelegant positioning of my hands on these vessels and the ungainly postural manner in which I brought their contents to my mouth. He then patiently showed me what he considered the aesthetically proper way to pick up and put down one's chopsticks and to hold one's rice bowl and cup. When I tried to emulate his method, inaccurately at first, he showed me and explained again until I grasped the principles, which I subsequently applied in practice. Everyday dining thus became a challenge in dramatic performance of mindful grace and movement, of aesthetically elegant eating through awakened appreciative awareness of all one's actions and feelings in taking one's food and drink. At first I was terrified. If my days were full of meditation, my nights were troubled by nightmares of soiling my new white training shirt or dogi with food dropping clumsily from my chopsticks or dripping from my careless drinking mouth. With no other shirt to change into, the shameful stain of my mindless, ugly eating would always remain exposed to Roshi's scornful condemnation and ridicule of my fellow trainees. I thus resolved to eat as carefully, deliberately, and mindfully as I could, despite being worried that my actions of eating would be rendered still more awkward by paying attention to them. In physiology and kinesiology and sports science, there is a common belief that if you pay attention to your action, that will render your action more clumsy. In other words, don't think about it, just do it, and you will perform with smooth spontaneity. I was very worried about that, but since I had already spent so much time and effort in finding the Zen Master, I decided I would make the effort of thinking about every mouthful I took and every moment of chewing. 
And I realized that it didn't ruin my coordination, that by developing the consciousness of what I was doing, I could actually eat with greater grace and proficiency. And at the end of a week, I was surprised to find that my white dogi was unstained by food. And that experiential lesson gave me confidence um, to advance the thesis that it is not impossible to pay attention to what you're doing, to do your bodily movements with greater awareness and still maintain a smooth spontaneity of action. And I developed those arguments in a more philosophical medium in my book, Body Consciousness, which will be coming out next year in Italian. And I conclude by just saying that my way of doing philosophy is to learn from the actual experience and then finding arguments to explain that experience rather than from reading texts or listening to them. And so I thank you for your patience in hearing me. And I hope we all together have a beautiful um, gastronomical experience here in Conventions of Lorenzo. And please don't let my lecture disturb you from the joy of eating. <laughs> we can practice the attentiveness at home. <laughs> <laughs>